following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. To understand today's topic, which is energy, we need to remember that in the previous lecture, we talked extensively about consciousness. Consciousness is that which gives us being. And every living thing has consciousness in its level. We have the consciousness of humanoids. But our mind, our psyche, is almost indistinguishable from the animal kingdom because we are ruled by instinct and desire. The only difference between us and animals is that we can reason. We have logic. We have different bodies, a different shape. But psychologically speaking, we are not that different from the other creatures that live on this planet, in the animal kingdom specifically. We have not really moved that far beyond the animal level. And if you need evidence of that, just observe the world. This world is being consumed by instinctual behavior, violence, theft, the fighting over territory or sexual rights, the domination of one group over another. This is all animal behavior, not human. not the behavior of a very elevated level of being. There are cultures and civilizations like that, but very few on this planet. We would like to have that. We all think of ourselves as elevated and evolved, but the, tra the reality is, when we're honest, our level of consciousness is really low. Our interest as a humanity is in power and sex and money, materialism, sensation. We want to live fast and die young. We want to get as much, accumulate as much, stand out as much as we can before we die. Because we're convinced we live once. So during that time, we want to dominate others and be recognized and enjoy ourselves as much as we can and then go out in a blaze of glory. This is our modern ethic. And obviously, it's completely misled, misguided. If we use that power of logic that we have, the power of reasoning, and we use it with our consciousness, unfiltered, that can become an incredibly powerful tool. And some examples that you can look to of how powerful it can be are people like Buddha Shakyamuni, people like Jesus, people like Moses, people like Guru Rinpoche Padmasambhava, Milarepa, many examples of great enlightened humanoids who went far beyond the animal level. So really our goal with learning meditation about that state of being is to become like that, to escape the animal level, become something more. This is really the purpose of being alive, to become something more. But as you know already, anything, any action, requires energy. In this very instant, you are consuming a great deal of energy, 
through how you are paying attention. Where you place your attention expends energy. There is a change that happens. Not only in the one who's expending it, but where it is spent. Modern science has already stated, even though humanity doesn't understand this, that when you observe something, you change it. This is known in physics. This is proven. And yet we, the common people of this planet, don't get it at all. We think that we are in a psychological cone of silence where we can do whatever we want and it doesn't affect anyone outside of us and it doesn't really affect us either. So we can think whatever we want. We can feel whatever we want. We can look at and observe anything we want. And there's no consequence for that. We're wrong. The use of attention is a use of energy. It is an action and all action has consequence. So energy is really what's being displayed in this image, the tree of life, levels and levels and levels of energy of every conceivable modality from the most dense to the most subtle. And they're really graded in that way. At the very top of that graphic are all the most subtle energies in existence and in non-existence or a state of potentiality that are not yet existing. That's what's shown at the very top. What is called in religions, the absolute Brahma, the Ein Sof in Hebrew, Shunyata in Sanskrit. That is unmanifested, uncreated light. Something that longs to be and will be according to the causes and conditions. And when it unfolds itself, when that light bursts forth from that potential state, it descends as a ray through creation, unfolding all existing things, universes. And that's what's represented here on the external aspect. From the most subtle levels all the way down, condensing and materializing deeper and deeper, all the way down into the hell levels. That's what's shown there. And all of that is in us. We are just a mirror of that, a reflection of it. That's why the Greek oracle said, know yourself and you will know the universe and its gods. Because all of that is in us, reflected in us as a consciousness. We have the capacity to become far more than a mere humanoid. We can become a god or what in Christian terms would be called an angel, or in Buddhist terms, a Buddha, or a master, whatever you want to call it. It is a being who has leapt out of the humanoid state and become something more. But to do it takes energy, a lot of energy. It isn't done through wishing. It isn't done through theories or beliefs. It is done through action with consciousness. It is our very root nature, the consciousness itself, that produces that state, that becomes that state. Nothing else can do it. Only our consciousness can do it. Not the body, not the mind, not our thoughts and beliefs and ideas, not our external behaviors, but the internal ones are what create that state what raise us and lower us through these different realms in nature. And if you consider that for a moment and you look at this image in the sense that it is given as densities, think about physics, basic physics. Is it easier to go up or down? If you're on a mountain, is it easier to go up the mountain or down the mountain? If you're in a rushing river, is it easier to go with the flow or against it? Spiritually, the exact same principle applies. The flow of energy, of forces in nature 
in our level is flowing down. Look at our society. Where is it going? Everybody wants to believe that we're going towards a golden age. But if you observe the facts, we are not. Just look at the facts. Take beliefs out of it. Take your hopes and aspirations out of it. Look at the reality and you will see a stark, terrifying truth. Humanity is not ascending. We are not getting better. We are getting worse. Statistically, it's proven. There is more slavery right now than there ever has been in history. We have no clean water anywhere on the planet. No clean air. The food is in decay. The whole planet is in decay. Our mind is in decay. There are no exceptions to that. Beliefs can't change it. Only action can. And if we want to rise out of that, to be different, to really have a fundamental change in our experience of being, it is not easy. The whole of the world is against it. The world wants us to become degenerated like everyone else. The world wants us to love degeneration, to embrace it, to celebrate your anger, to celebrate your lust, to indulge in your fear through TV and movies and all of that. Culture wants us to be hypnotized by our traumas, to love them, to suffer with them. Society doesn't want us to change. Nowhere in our media, in our entertainment, in all the things that we love and worship and pursue, do we find anyone representing the virtues of the soul? You don't see TV shows about being patient, about how to really love other people, how to be generous, how to be chaste, how to be altruistic. Instead, all the shows are about how to commit crimes, how to kill, how to steal, how to lie, how to murder. Everything, all of it, violence, terrible crimes. That's all we watch, it's all we take in, that's all we consume every day. How can a golden age emerge from that if no one is learning what makes a golden age? But instead, we're only learning more and more clever ways of defeating each other, of being sarcastic and being cruel. That's what we learn from TV. So to go against that current, not only the one that's outside of us, but the one that is inside of us, takes incredible energy. And yet we don't have much energy. We're tired all the time. We're unhappy. We suffer. Yet we know somehow there must be an answer. That's why we seek spirituality. Some part of us has that longing to change and senses that it must be there. And it is. There is a way. There is hope. And it is within us, not outside. It is the consciousness itself. It is the key that can change everything for us. So in the previous lecture, we were explaining that consciousness is a state of being. It is perception. It is an alert cognitive state. It is the beingness in this moment. And our being in this moment has qualities. It has powers. It has energy. We are here and now, present, I hope. Not distracted, I hope. Aware of what's being discussed, I hope. That is consciousness, simple. Simply that. But that is not all it can be. Remember, this image of the tree of life shows not only the external aspect of nature, but the internal part. So it maps for us all the infinite potential of the consciousness. Right now, as we are listening to this subject and, and, 
contemplating this subject, we're all in our physical bodies. This is represented on the tree by Malkut, which means kingdom in Hebrew. It's the lowest sphere, the tenth sphere from the, from the top to the bottom. And yet, as we're contemplating this and listening to the lecture, are we conscious of the body? Are we really aware of being in the physical body? Are we aware of our ears and how they function? Are we aware of our eyes themselves, physically, and how they are functioning? Are we aware of heat and temperature and all the other qualities that the body perceives through the senses? And those bits of data are constantly striking the consciousness through perception. Are we aware of all that? Moreover, are we aware of how the words that I'm saying strike the mind and cause reactions? Associative thought. Oh, I remember this. Or, oh, that reminds me of this. Or, oh, I think he's wrong. Or, oh, that's right. All those reactions that are being produced psychologically in us, are we aware of that too? And can we be aware of all of that at the same time from moment to moment? without losing track of it. Now, if you're doing it now because I'm pointing it out, good. This is what we should be doing all the time. Constantly being here and now, using our consciousness to its fullest capacity and pushing it out, expanding it, pushing it, training it, teaching it, growing it. But it takes energy. Because you'll find in just a few minutes from now, you'll become distracted and you'll not be keeping the flow of what I'm talking about and you'll catch yourself and say, oh, I, okay, I was distracted. What is he talking about now? What, what's happening now? In the, let me catch up. Because of lack of attention, lack of energy. These two are what need to change in us. Lack of attention, lack of energy. We need energy, but we need attention too. What is energy? The tree of life shows us all the potential energies in existence and in non-existence. Potential. I already mentioned to you that we have a physical body, which is here, Malkut. But you see, that is only a fraction of what's shown on this image. There's much more. So energy in itself, if you look in the dictionary, comes from Greek energia, which is activity, action, operation. Originally, the term was used in philosophy to refer to a sense of reality. Nowadays, we only use this word energy when we're talking about charging our cell phone or the car or the house or the energy crisis that all the nations are facing, this type of thing. We never really think of energy as something personal, especially in relation with psychology, with spirituality. But really, this is the most important form of energy or aspect of energy, is how it relates to our state of being. Many students who learn about meditation, they go to temples and monasteries, they go to schools and groups, they learn to sit in a certain posture and they do certain types of exercises and they consider themselves meditators, yet they don't get anywhere. They may meditate for 10, 20, 30 years and can look like experts and talk like experts. But in their inner experience, simply sit in that motionless posture for one, two, three hours and don't get anywhere. They may have very good concentration. They may be able to steady their psyche and be serene, but they don't go anywhere from that. And they are wasting their time. That is not meditation. That is just sitting still. Sitting still is good, but it doesn't grow your soul. It does not expand your perception of reality. That is what energy is for. Energy that nourishes the consciousness expands it. You see, most of the people that learn meditation in this era, especially in the West, 
They may learn how to sit, how to concentrate, how to talk the talk, but they don't learn how to conserve and use energy. They learn concentration and that's it. You cannot develop the consciousness if you are not conserving and working with energy. It's impossible. They are like those who buy a very nice car but don't know how to put gas in it. So the car sits in the driveway and they go sit in their nice car and they love their nice car and everybody comes to look at it and they all admire this nice car but they can't drive it because it has no fuel. This is sad, but it's extremely common. Many of the so-called meditation experts are like that. They are expert at concentration, but they know nothing about real meditation because there's no fuel for them to escape their level. It's very easy to go down the mountain. It's very difficult to go up the mountain. It takes energy. And if there's no energy there, what will happen? You'll roll down the hill. Previously, we also talked about degrees of consciousness or states of consciousness. And this is really important to understand in relation with energy. Consciousness is either on or off. This means that one is either awake or asleep. We're not talking about the physical body being asleep. We're talking about your perception your consciousness. Most of the people on this planet at this moment have their physical bodies active, but their consciousness asleep. They look like they are doing things, but psychologically they are dreaming. They aren't aware of themselves at all. They are in a dream state, even though the physical body is moving around. They're asleep, and all of us are too. To be awake takes energy. To be awake is to be here and now. It is to be cognizant. That means intelligently, actively observing. To know that you're sitting in a chair is not the same thing as observing it. This is the difference. To know that you're in the cafe ordering a coffee is not the same as observing yourself doing it. To know that you are feeling angry is not the same as to be observing the anger. Two different things. In other words, to be asleep is to be passive, mechanical, to just go with the flow. And you know where the flow will take you. If you step back and really observe the reality of your inner landscape and your outer landscape, if you just go with the flow, you will gain nothing from life but pain. You will die with none of your questions answered, with your purpose obscured. To be awake takes effort. It takes energy. It takes remembering to do it. And that's why on this image on the left side of the monk on the path, at the very bottom, we see a raging fire down here in the corner. That represents how much energy and effort it takes to begin. It takes an incredible amount of energy to begin. But as you start to learn as your consciousness gets stronger, it becomes stronger. And little by little, that flame gets smaller and smaller until it becomes natural. Because the conscious, its natural ability is to be present. The natural ability of the consciousness is to perceive. It doesn't now because we have hypnotized it. For a long time. Hypnotized it with all of our fears and our desires and our traumas and longings, all of our pains and sufferings, all of our bad habits, psychological bad habits. We put it to sleep 
That's why we have all those myths. Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, all those myths. That woman that falls asleep is represented here in the Tree of Life by Geburah, the Sephira. She is called the Divine Soul. She is Beatrice from the Divine Comedy. She is Helen of the Greeks. She is that maiden that's in danger of being eaten by the dragon. There's no literal woman like that. That woman represents our consciousness who is asleep. She ate that poisoned apple and fell asleep and needs the hero, the valiant warrior, to wake her up, to save her. All of that is myths that hide truths. We need to awaken that maiden, and that maiden is in us. But that awakening has to be a constant thing, all the time, 24 hours a day. Remembering to be awake, to be aware, to be watchful, to observe. I know nowadays people talk a lot about mindfulness. This is fine. It's the beginning. It's not everything. It's like kindergarten. We need it. It's how you start forming the language and the words for the real work. It is not all the work. The other thing about consciousness, aside from being awake or asleep, is whether it's conditioned or unconditioned. By conditioned, we're implying many things. When we look again at this tree of life, we see this uh, increasing density as we go down the tree. And that density is matter and energy and consciousness. All that is getting denser and denser the lower we look at that map. Which means that the further down you go, the more conditioned things are. At the very top is completely unconditioned. Life is completely and utterly unrestricted, free. It is the state of utmost simplicity. When that emerges into manifestation, it is one law, very simple, very profound. That one becomes three. This is where we get the Trinity in all the different religions. This is where we get the Gunas of Hinduism, the Trikaya, the Holy Trinity of Christianity, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Keter, Hokma, Bina, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That Trinity is inside of us. It is a level of three laws. Three is the power of creation. We're going to talk a lot about that later. That three unfolds further into six, into 12, into 24, into 48, into 96, and further and further. Those laws multiply on top of each other and become more and more dense. When you walk around this planet, you're passing from zone to zone, from psychological environment to psychological environment. And you can observe how in some places, the psychology is very simple. And in other places, the psychology is very dense. Notice how you feel when you go from the heart of a big city out to the countryside. It isn't just the nature that's doing that for you, that feeling. It's the psychology of the people in those places. In the city, the psychology is very dense. It's very low. People are only concerned about money and survival and competition. So the level of conditioning is very strong. You are expected to have a certain kind of house, a certain kind of car, to dress a certain kind of way and talk a certain kind of way and have a certain amount of money. So in other words, you have to condition yourself to be like them to run that rat race. This same principle applies to all the levels of nature. When you have experiences, psychological, spiritual experiences, let's say in dreams, you can also experience this range of complexity. You have nightmares where you feel the density and heaviness and fear and anger and pain of those lower realms. You can also experience the heavens, places that are extremely light, where you feel free, 
happy, unconditioned. All of that is in us. Unfortunately, most of our consciousness is trapped in conditioning. And that's what's represented on this lower part of the tree of life. This is called klipok, which means the world of shells. In common language, we call it hell. That is our mind. Our mind that is conditioned by the traumas we've been through, by the wrong ways of thinking that we've been programmed with, by all of our fears, our anger, our resentment, our lust, our greed, our envy. All of that is hell. And all of that conditions our behavior. We aren't aware of it. Why do we have the job we have? Why do we have the spouse that we have? Why do we have the habits that we have? Because of conditioning that we aren't aware of. We have 97% of our consciousness trapped in conditioning. That's why humanity is in the state that it's in. That's why this planet is cracking. We only have a tiny fraction of consciousness left that's free, that has the potential to lead us out of that cage. And this is represented in the Bible. It's represented in many myths. The one in the Bible is David and Goliath. David is that small child, that 3% that's not yet trapped. And Goliath and the whole Philistine army is the 97% that wants to eat him. We have that warfare going on in us all the time. It's that battle between good and evil in us, right and wrong. It's the conscience. We have to learn to listen to that quiet voice that knows right from wrong. And that's the conscience, that 3%. Awake, asleep, conditioned, unconditioned. We're in a grave situation. I know it's disheartening. I know it's hard to hear, but it's the truth. And we wouldn't say it unless there was a way to fix it. There is a way. That conscience, the 3%, is like a candle flame. Sometimes it's not lit. It's lit when we are awake, when we are present here and now. Then that candle flame is lit, psychologically speaking. And that light, of course, separates the darkness. It doesn't illuminate everything because we don't have much energy. We don't have much of that consciousness unconditioned. The darkness is the conditioned mind that we need to reveal. An awakened being has much more than a candle. Someone like Buddha or Jesus, Krishna, is a sun. Compare the light of these two. Compare the relative energy of a candle to a sun. And you will understand the difference between us and the gods. Because really they are gods. We, we think of the term gods as... Beings that have greater power than us, that have a longer life than us, that have more insight, more ability, they are that. They exist. They exist on levels that we can barely comprehend, that we don't even know exist, but they are there. A sun gives life. It's constantly transforming energy and benefiting others. If we contemplate that, we consider just our sun and how many living things depend on it. It is really overwhelming. Just even on the physical level to consider that. And then compare ourselves with that. How many living things depend upon us? How many living things are nourished by the light that we radiate? Because believe it or not, we do. We radiate a light. It is our quality of being. And that quality of being affects everyone we contact, whether we're aware of it or not. 
Science knows that any time two entities come in close proximity with each other, they are both changed. This is a fact in science, proven. We don't get it. Like I said, we think we exist in this vacuum where whatever we are and think and do and feel inside is completely separated from humanity and everything outside. We're wrong about that. On a very superficial level, we can observe, if we pay attention, watch an angry person. If you work in a big office where there's a lot of people, watch an angry person move through that office and spread their anger to everyone else. It's extremely infectious, more infectious than the flu or any disease. Anger. That person just storms around and everybody else gets infected with it. Can't help it. The state of being that we have, the energy that we are transforming in ourselves from moment to moment is affecting everything else around us. There is a reciprocal relationship. In our physical bodies, our consciousness is perceiving through the conditioning of the body. And the physical body provides senses, touch, taste, smell, hearing, sight. Those are conditioning factors. In other words, what I perceive through my eyes is conditioned by my eyes. If my eyesight is poor, I won't see much. If my hearing is no good, I'm not going to hear much. If my hearing is really good, I'll hear more. So hearing is a condition that filters the energy that moves through those senses. Deeper than that, our psyche is a conditioning we can perceive thought. We don't perceive thought with our eyes or our ears or our sense of touch or taste, but we do perceive it with a sense, right? Everyone can perceive thoughts. Everyone can perceive memory. Everyone can perceive images in your mind. And these are all conditioning factors we're scarcely aware of it. In other words, anything that we can perceive may well be filtered, conditioned, but we never realize it. We take our perceptions at face value, and that's why we always interpret them wrong. We start a new job, our boss is rude, and obnoxious, and we develop an impression of that person that never changes because we never see anything else of that person. We only saw through the filter of those conditioning circumstances. We may not know why that boss was rude and obnoxious. We may not know that that person just found out that morning they have cancer. We may not know why they are the way they are. We just have this attitude of resentment and anger towards them. No comprehension, no compassion. We are all like that. We don't see the conditioning factors of our perceptions. This is really critical because it changes our energy. It changes our experience. The main thing to understand here is that through all of these types of perception, we can only perceive through them if there is energy to do it. And they all consume energy and transform energy. You know, when you get really tired, your ability to perceive starts to reduce, doesn't it? Haven't you ever driven a car when you're getting really sleepy? Doesn't it get harder and harder to see? You start falling asleep and you just cannot see and it takes all of your effort. You're trying to bring all your energy into your eyeballs to still see the road and you're falling asleep because your energy is going all the way to zero. You're depleted. The same thing happens with your consciousness. We deplete it. We run out of energy. The same thing happens with 
being aware of thoughts and feelings, being aware of memory, being aware of everything that's happening in us psychologically, we need energy to see it, energy to be aware of it, energy to understand that these are conditions. So let's talk about some basic types of energy so we can put this all in perspective. Looking at the tree of life, we see at the very top, the first thing that comes out is this light called the Ein Sof Or. And then after that comes this trinity. And that trinity in Greek is called the Logos. And that means word. So the way we can think about that, to try to start understanding that, and it is important to understand when you're learning about meditation. Logos being a word is the expression of something subtle inside. When I'm saying a word, I'm trying to bring something from inside of me outside. So logos is like that in nature. It is that first expression of the inexpressible. Something that is latent and potential and hidden that becomes visible. That is logos. That's in us, not outside of us. And that is a level of energy that is very subtle. In Buddhism, they call this the trikaya. And this is one of the most important aspects of the higher aspects or higher teachings of Buddhism. Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. We'll get to that sometime later. Those are potential states of being that we can reach. A level of experience that is really incomprehensible to us. But a fully developed Buddha exists at that level. A state of such profound qualities, we can't comprehend it. When that energy condenses further, we see the unfoldment of all the other energies on the tree. That logos unfolds into atmic energy, which in Hebrew is called chesed. And this is what we call our innermost, our being. And the Bible calls it our father. Hinduism calls it atman. This is spirit. That energy unfolds, condenses into the buddhik, or what in Hinduism and Sanskrit is called buddhi. And that's the divine soul that I mentioned earlier, which is represented or symbolized as a female. In the Nordic tradition, she is the Valkyrie, Brunhilde, a, ter a terrifying warrior. She has incredible powers that symbolize the conscious energy. That unfolds further into Tifereth, which means beauty. And that's what we call the human soul. And that is where we find our free will. That unfolds further into what we call the four bodies of sin. These four lower sephiroth on the tree. Intellect, emotion, vital energy, physical energy. Netzah represents thought. What we experience here as thinking corresponds to that sphere. Hod corresponds to what we experience here as emotion. Yasod corresponds to what we experience here as vital energy. If you've ever been to an acupuncturist, that's what they're working on. Yasod, our vital energy. Finally, Malkut, the physical body, mechanical energy. All of these energies are flowing in us right now. They aren't outside of us. They aren't in some distant place. They aren't above the ceiling or above your head. They are here and now in you. But as you can see, from the physical to the vital, things get really subtle really fast. And from the vital to the emo emotional, they get more subtle. And from the emotional to thought, even more subtle. And from thought to will, even more subtle. And from will to consciousness, even more subtle. So step by step, that's in us. But can we perceive it? Moreover, can we work with it? 
Can we harness it and use it? Can we change it? When you're really serious about working in your spiritual life, these are your tools. Which of them can you access? Which of them can you use? Which of them are you aware of? Most people don't have a clue about this. But it's the basis of spiritual life. The true basis of it. Now, the key here is this. All of this is inside of us. We're experiencing it all the time right now. And we're using it according to our state of being. When we're angry, when we're despairing, when we're depressed, what does that do with these energies? Remember, every state of being that we have is a transformation of energy. It changes the energy, not only inside of us, but it affects people outside of us. When we're having negative thoughts, negative emotions, when we are feeling envious and we want to satisfy that envy by getting the thing that we desire, how is that affecting our level of being? How is that affecting our spiritual state? How is that affecting other people? You see, that's a transformation of energy. We're scarcely aware of it. And we wonder why we're in the situation that we're in. The thing is, we are a transformer of energy on every level. Physically, we are breathing, drinking, eating, energy. You take that food and your body destroys it and extracts the energy out of it to sustain itself for a few hours more. And that's all you get out of it. A few more hours. Then you have to eat again. You drink water. Your body destroys it, takes what it can from it, and expels the remainder. And it keeps you alive for a few more hours. You breathe. Your body destroys those elements, takes what it needs, and you can live for another breath. But do you realize that your senses are also doing the same thing? Everything you see, hear, taste, touch, smell, think, feel, you're doing the same process. You are ingesting impressions. When you watch that TV show, your consciousness is taking that matter, those impressions, when we watch TV, we go on autopilot. We're hypnotized. We're not aware of ourselves. We're feeling the emotions of the actors, not our own emotions. We're feeling what the director and the producers and the writers and the actors want us to feel. What the advertisers want us to feel. And we feel it because we're robots, programmed. What is all that energy? What is it creating? What is the result? What do we get out of it? We get distracted. We get entertained. We get a couple of laughs. We get to pass some time. But what do we get out of it spiritually? Are we living for that? Is that the purpose of our life? Is to make the corporations richer and the actors more famous? What does our consciousness get out of it? What does our soul get out of it? How does it grow us as a being? How are we transforming that energy? Who is benefiting? We don't ask these questions. We don't care. This is why we're in the state that we're in. But if we can learn to use this incredible machine of the body to instead of transforming energy for the benefit of the rich and the wealthy and the parasites that feed off of us to benefit our soul, to benefit those who suffer, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our community members, the people around us that we see all the time who are in pain and suffering, if we can transform our energy to benefit them, we can become a sun that gives life, not that feeds parasites, 
but that feeds souls. This transformer of energy of the body has many subtleties and many powers. So if we focus in on the bottom portion of the tree of life, we see all these spheres and their relative energies. If we learn to use them wisely, we can expand the consciousness. We can awaken it. And we can start to experience these other worlds for ourselves. Here we are in our physical bodies. We're barely aware of being in the physical body. Probably in our lifetime, we have rarely ever really been aware of how our eyeballs perceive, how our ears hear, how our hands work, how our tongue functions. We're barely aware of it. We just take it for granted. We just use them and go along and have no awareness at all of how miraculous the body is. But really the body is impermanent. It's just a shell. It isn't our identity. It's a temporary housing that's being utilized by the energies that are activating it. Firstly, the vitality. Yasod. The physical body is able to be active because of the energy that powers it. The main one is the vitality. If you take that vitality away, the physical body is dead. It dies. What about the emotional aspect? We all experience that, but we're not aware of it. When we dream, we are traveling, experiencing, acting in this level of Hod. The emotional body, what some people call the astral body. That is not a physical dimension. It is not a physical energy. It is emotional energy. When you dream, you are in that level of nature. Dreaming, unaware of yourself. Maybe every once in a while you're aware that you're dreaming. Oh, I'm here, I'm dreaming, this can't be real. It is real, it's just not physical. Likewise, successively in more subtle levels, there's a world of thought, a world of will, a world of of buddhi, and a world of atman, world of spirit. These are more and more subtle aspects of our psychology. In meditation, the state of meditation, you can experience any of them. Not only as states of consciousness that you experience here and now, but states of consciousness that you experience out of the physical body. Someone who knows how to access the state of meditation is learning how to separate the consciousness from the physical senses. In other words, when we really learn to meditate, we put the body in a position of rest. We make it still. We relax it. And we leave it alone. And we extract attention from the senses. In other words, we let go of feeling and thinking and hearing and seeing and tasting and touching and all of that. We extract the energy from the senses. And if you learn to do that effectively, the physical body will essentially sleep the same way it does when you take a nap. It will rest and recharge itself like a battery. When we meditate or make the effort to learn about the state of meditation, are we just focused on physicality or are we leaving it behind? Are we conditioned by physical sensations? by energetic sensations, by emotional sensations, by thought, by will. Many people who try to learn about meditation observe the breath. And because that's all they know how to do, they become fixated on the physical sensations of breathing and they stay there. And that's all they ever get out of their practice. Not realizing that that observation of breath is only a preliminary exercise. It is not meditation. It is a concentration practice. It is not meditation. To really meditate, one must abandon all physicality. One must abandon all vital energy, 
all emotion, all thought, all will, all consciousness, all spirit, going higher and higher and higher and higher. Any living thing can do this. There's nothing abnormal or unnatural about it. All you're doing is stripping away the conditioning filters on the consciousness itself until you can reach as high as you can on that graphic. The state of meditation is accelerated or reached rapidly when we start stripping off the filters that condition the consciousness. And all of those are energetic. Now, these... I realize that many people who study spirituality become really identified with these different levels, fascinated by them. There are people who call themselves energy workers. And they are fascinated by this vital body, by energy in that body. They're wasting their time. And there are people who are fascinated, hypnotized by the notion of astral projection. And they get very identified with that. And they're wasting their time. Or they get fascinated or identified with angels and demons and other beings and extraterrestrials and all this other types of stuff. And they're wasting their time. These levels of nature are natural. They're part of us. But they are not our true nature. And knowing about them is useful. Learning about them and experiencing them is useful. But what we really need to do is learn to change our fundamental experience of life. Some people are very fascinated by chakras. But let me tell you, being fascinated by the chakras is the same as a plumber who's fascinated with pipe fittings. Because that's all they are. There's nothing special about chakras. They are just points of connection between these different aspects of ourselves. They just move energy from one place to another. Big deal. Don't be fascinated by them. They're useful, we need them, they're important, and we need them to function properly. But they are not spirituality in and of themselves. We have many chakras throughout us. Chakras are not physical they are multidimensional. They are conduits or transformers of energy that move energy from one level to another. Most people talk about seven chakras. There's many more than that. There are too many to count. A chakra is simply a place where currents meet. And if you study our esoteric anatomy, you'll find thousands upon thousands upon thousands of conduits of energy if you look at Chinese acupuncture or Tibetan acupuncture and how they map the meridians through the body, it is overwhelming how many conduits of energy there are. Sanskrit calls them nadis. So many, and everywhere a nadi crosses another one is a chakra. But these, on this map, are fundamental ones that have a relationship with our spiritual life. And they need energy to function. And they provide benefits. So in the same way that we have senses in our physical body, our internal bodies also have senses. And those senses are related with the chakras. There are senses like intuition, senses like profound memory, and the ability to perceive things that are not physical. None of these are abnormal. They are part of a naturally functioning being. In our case, we are so conditioned that these don't function. But in essence, between each of these spheres, the chakras pass energy. That's all they do. They pass energy. What matters is how they do it. How they do it. And that's up to us. For example, the heart chakra very important. This is an energetic center related with our physical heart. And it's in that region of our body. And it's a very beautiful transformer of energy. But when you're angry, when you're lustful, 
that center is just processing the energy that you're giving it. You see, the, the chakra itself is just a transformer. It doesn't awaken you. It just transforms that energy. If your heart is saturated with depression, with anger, with despair or fear, your heart chakra is irradiating that quality. That's all it's doing. It's passing that energy from your emotional body through your vital body into your physical body. Your state of being is projected through the chakras. More concrete for us, we have these centers that transform energy. Five centers, primary centers that we need to understand. These are much more important than chakras. The intellect, the emotional center, motor, instinctual, and sexual centers. These are also transformers of energy. They are machines. Our intellectual center is related with our physical brain. The brain is also just a machine, a transformer of energy. It isn't our identity. I know scientists nowadays think that they're going to take our brains and freeze them and we're going to live forever. They're totally mistaken. It's like thinking that you're going to freeze someone's car and save the driver. The brain is not the driver. The brain is the steering wheel. The brain is only taking the energies and influences that are coming from the psyche, which are not physical, they're internal, whether the superior aspect or inferior aspect. The thoughts that flow through your brain, through your intellectual center, are coming from your unconscious, subconscious, infraconscious levels, and maybe sometimes from the superior parts, the unconditioned parts. Maybe sometimes we actually have a positive thought. Most of the time, we're just repeating the same thoughts we had yesterday. Same with the emotional center. It's just a transformer of energy. All it can do is register what is happening in the astral body, the emotional body. And it displays it here physically for us to experience that. So when you feel emotional impulses, you're feeling that machine that's just displaying the information that's coming from somewhere else, from your psyche. Observe how a person utilizes these five centers. The people who are intensely intellectual tend to develop very strong mental problems. They deplete the energy of the intellect. They abuse it, they go crazy. People who abuse the emotional center become emotionally traumatized, emotionally exhausted. They deplete it. They break it. It's like if you have a race car and you're constantly overusing the engine, you'll burn it out. It's the same case with these centers. Prostitutes that abuse the in instinctual and sexual centers age very rapidly. Their whole organism just decays very fast because they abuse that energy. All of us are guilty of abusing these centers because we don't understand them. Moreover, they steal energy from each other. Your job, the very intellectual job, you're constantly analyzing data, you start to get tired, you start drinking coffee, you start bringing in any kind of other energy source you can, and your intellect will start stealing energy from the other centers, especially the physical body. That's why the intellectual types tend to be very weak physically and very inexperienced emotionally. They can only understand other intellectuals. So if an intellectual type of person gets married with an emotional type of person, they will constantly fight because they don't understand each other. The goal when you're learning to access meditation is firstly to learn about these centers and how they use energy. Secondly, to balance them. Thirdly, to save their energy. Now that rule applies to everything else that we've explained. The chakras and all of the bodies and all the subtleties of these energies. But all of that, 
the mental body, the astral body, the body of will, the vital body, the physical body, all of that is passing through these five centers right now. So we start here. You want to know about your astral body? Start working with your emotional center in your physical life. If you want to have astral projections, you want to know about getting lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, whatever you want to call it, basically being awake in the dream state, you need to save emotional energy now in your physical life. The reason you don't remember your dreams is because your emotional center is depleted. Dream recall, cognizant dreaming, astral projection are all fueled by emotional energy. If you want those experiences, save your emotional energy. Find where you waste it and stop. We waste it on bad TV, getting identified with emotions, getting identified with music. Anything that pulls your emotions out, you get angry, you get upset, you get mad, you get whatever those types of emotions that identify you, that hypnotize you, that's where you waste it. Save it. If you want to comprehend scripture, if you want to understand difficult things in your life, to understand what I'm talking about in this lecture, <laughs> save intellectual energy. Don't waste it on fruitless reading, studying things that are a waste of time. Use it on things that are beneficial for you and others. So in general, we want to learn to start saving these energies and putting them to use in a good and beneficial way. At the same time we're doing that, we need to learn about how the consciousness works. Obviously, we need to learn to be here now, to be present. Not just in class, not just when we try to meditate every once in a while, but all the time. And being present takes energy, a lot of energy. Part of learning to be present is learning to observe the relationship between the observer and what is observed. There is a profound relationship between your state of being and what you are experiencing, what you are perceiving. There's a profound relationship between them. And this directly affects the quality of energy in your life. As you start to observe yourself, you need to start becoming aware of this relationship between the observer, which is your consciousness, and what is observed. And by what is observed, I mean all phenomena. Not just physical things. Anything that you can observe. Start to be aware of the relationship. Here's why this is important. Wherever we direct attention, we expend energy. If we want to expand our perception, then we need to expend our energy wisely and get a return on it, get something back from it. Have that expenditure benefit us and others. When you're observing something, the consciousness inside of you is perceiving. This is obvious. What is not obvious to us is that that act of observation changes that phenomena and it changes us too. We think that we can watch that action movie with all that violence and it won't affect us. And we're dead wrong. Everything that we see changes us. Humanity is at the level of consciousness it is because of how it is hypnotized by phenomena. We're always complaining about the state of the world. You know, the government's like this and the corporations are like this and those Republicans and those Democrats and we're always complaining, not realizing that all of those external people suffer the exact same problem that we do, which is that we don't see ourselves. We don't see that our state of being was made by ourselves. 
Our parents didn't make us this way. Our spouse did not make us this way. Our friends did not make us this way. We made ourselves the way that we are. Every religious tradition in the world agrees with this. Every one of them has scriptures about this. The Bible says that everyone will reap what they sow. If we want happiness, we have to stop sowing seeds of discontentment. Always seeking what we don't have. Always envying what others have that we don't. Always jealous. Always craving. Always desiring. Always complaining. All of that psychological experience is what's creating our sufferings, creating our level of experience. It is this relationship between the observer and the observed. We are unaware of the filters, the filters between the observer and the observed. We get an argument with our spouse, with our friend, and we feel completely justified that we are right. We're not seeing the filter of the anger, the filter of our pride, the filter of our fear, our physical body. We're not seeing the other person for who they are. We're not seeing why they said what they said or felt what they felt. We're only seeing our anger and what our anger wants us to see. Simple example, but we're constantly engaged in that same flawed phenomenon. So to begin a spiritual life, to really change, we have to work with energy in a new way. And that starts with observing ourselves. That self-observation has to be a constant effort from moment to moment. This is not a part-time job. If you want to climb a mountain or swim upstream, you need a lot of energy to do it. What are you willing to sacrifice? Really comes down to that. What are you willing to sacrifice? We talk about three fundamental factors. Remember I said the law of three creates. We're going to talk a lot about that. Three factors that are always in motion. Birth, death, and sacrifice. If we want to give birth to a new spiritual life, to a new level of being, if we really want to raise ourselves up out of the animal level and become something new, something has to die. With every death, there is birth. When you eat your meal, that food dies. And what is born out of it is your nourishment. So that food is sacrificed. We don't generally think of it that way, but it is that way. When we drink water, the energies and substances in that glass are sacrificed. They die to give us life. So the birth, death, and sacrifice are happening in every transformation of energy on every level. So if we want a new spiritual life, if we want to learn to access the state of meditation, if we want to rise up out of the animal level, if we want to escape suffering, we have to give up bad habits. We have to sacrifice our anger, our pride, our desires, our lust, our cravings, all those things that keep us hypnotized. To become something new, you have to stop being what you are. This is not a matter of belief, it's a matter of action. So it starts with observing oneself, to learn about oneself, the facts of oneself, not your beliefs about yourself or your theories, but to start observing the way things really are, to be honest. The second part is to learn to save energy in every way possible, but specifically with these five centers. To start learning to save energy. So when you get these habits and cravings that you've got, like you've got these habits of intellectual habits or emotional habits or motor habits would be um, physical things that we do. Motor skills are, are things that the body learns. Instinctual things are ingrained in us. And of course, sex is how we use our sexual energy. Can we give up 
inferior behaviors in order to fuel superior ones? How far are we willing to go? How much are we willing to give to be awakened? Most people on this planet don't care about this at all. It's sad, but they don't. They may like the idea of religion or spirituality, but they just want somebody to tell them that everything's going to be okay. Just believe in such and such and write a check to so and so and you will have spiritual life forever after. But reality doesn't work like that. To be born in a new level, to raise your level of experience up into superior worlds requires incredible sacrifice. And that's why when we study the history of all the prophets and saints and masters from out history, we see how much they gave, how much they were willing to give up, how much to renounce, how much to die. Now that's the question we have to ask ourselves. If we don't want to change, then this teaching is not for us. If we are willing, if we really want to know what God is personally, if we want to talk face to face with divine beings, if we want to escape the limited, narrow band of life that society is offering us, we can. But we have to give up what keeps us chained to it. So we need to learn to save energy in every way we can. We also need to start ingesting the best possible energy. Most of us are already trying to eat well. We know we should eat organic. We shouldn't drink alcohol. We shouldn't smoke cigarettes or take drugs. We know that stuff. So do it. But the physical energy can only change your physical experience. No matter how much energy you expend physically, you cannot change the superior levels with physical energy. So all those people who are going to yoga class thinking that they're going to become masters are deeply mistaken. Moving your physical body around does not awaken the consciousness. Only working with consciousness awakens it. If you want to change your emotional quality, your astral quality, you can't do it by manipulating physical matter. You have to manipulate the astral matter to change the astral body, the emotional body. If you want to change your way of thinking, modifying your physical body doesn't change that. It's obvious, isn't it? It doesn't matter if you sit or stand. Your thinking will be the same until you change at the level of thought. This means that if you want good quality spiritual energy, you need to consume good quality spiritual nourishment. If you want to have a good quality emotional life, you need to feed your emotional center with good quality energy. It's simple. Just like the health of your physical body, the health of your heart and mind are affected by what you feed them. So learn to feed them good things. And finally, all the energy we take in, we have to learn to transform it in a superior way. There are lots of spiritual traditions that also help us accumulate energy. These are the most profound. Sexual purity is the most important. That is the most important energy that we have. The way we use it affects us more than any other energy we will ever access in our lifetime. The sexual energy has more potency, more power, and more reach than any other energy your physical body can access. So the way you use it has more effect on you than anything else you do. Anything. There's no comparison. That's why all religions start their beginners with learning to become pure sexually. They take different types of vows or adopt different practices in order to contain that energy and start to transform it in a positive way. Next would be the use of sounds, sacred words, and mantras, prayers. There's also breathing exercises like pranayama, ritually blessed food like Eucharist or tzok, and then different movement exercises, yantras, runes, rites of rejuvenation, yoga type practices. All of these are ways of accumulating energy. And a lot of people do all this stuff because they like it, but they don't know what it's for. 
accumulating energy has no point if we're not working with the consciousness. All of these exercises exist to feed the consciousness, to strengthen it. So when yogis are learning pranayamas, when the monks are learning to chant, it is designed, those exercises are designed to charge the consciousness with energy, to strengthen it, so they can do their spiritual work. So we also learn these types of techniques. With each of these classes, we give exercises that you can use till we have the next lecture to help you understand what we discussed. So there's two for this week. The first is to learn every day to start observing yourself. Not only to observe, but to be aware of the energy it takes to do it. Here's the thing about self-observation. You're going to forget. You might go most of the day without remembering to observe yourself. But then all of a sudden you'll think, oh, I'm supposed to be observing myself. I'm supposed to be here and now. That's excellent. How long can you sustain it? So, like I said earlier, in the beginning, this takes a lot of energy to learn to observe yourself. So many students complain, it's too exhausting. I feel tired all the time. I'm doing it wrong. No, you're not. You're doing it right. It does feel tiring in the beginning. It does. That's normal. Until you become well-trained, it takes a lot of energy. And then at the end of each day, it's very effective and useful to take some time and really reflect on that. Just to isolate yourselves from all distractions and really reflect on, was I really aware of myself today? How much did I observe myself? How much was I really conscious of myself? And that practice, we're going to grow into some very uh, profound things later on. With the self-observation, trying to like grasp like exactly what I'm supposed to do. Is like when I'm, if I'm angry, am I supposed to be in the moment and say, I mean, I know I'm angry, but I guess I'm having a hard, kind of hard time. The self-observation is the gathering of facts. That's all it is. It is to be an observer. So when you become aware that you're angry, you observe it. And you observe it in those centers. Okay, I'm feeling angry. Now let's observe this. Let's watch it and see what it's doing. You'll see the anger is producing thoughts. It's stimulating your thinking to go in a certain direction. It's stimulating your emotions to feel certain ways. It's stimulating the body to act. You get these impulses to behave in certain ways. It also is changing your perceptions. You know, when you're angry, you see everything through your anger. The self-observation is simply that process of becoming a, a separate observer from yourself. You become uh, an observer of an actor, in other words. And this is where you start to become aware that your body is not who you are, your thoughts are not who you are, your feelings are not who you are, your impulses are not who you are. So who are you? But that has to be something that's experienced repeatedly and again and again where you start to really feel that sense of separation. It's an internal sense of separation. Can you talk a little bit about judgment of those, those tongues? Yeah, this is the hard thing because our tendency will be to immediately start judging ourselves and condemning ourselves or justifying ourselves. Well, I'm right to be angry. You know, she did this and that, and she shouldn't have done this and that. And, you know, I have this long history of things that happen. So I should be mad. That all has to be observed. Where we separate from that and say, okay, yeah, I see I'm justifying, or I see that I'm rationalizing. I'm blaming them. You know, you just become aware of everything that's happening. Self-observation is the first part of a more profound work. And that profound work has three phases. So I'm going to outline that for you now so that you, you can get this in context. Self-observation is phase one, the first part. It's where you acquire information. I talked in the beginning a little bit about how desperate our situation is, but I barely scratched the surface. The truth is, 
we are teetering on the brink, not only as a world, as a planet, as a civilization, but as individuals. None of us have any idea when we're going to die. We can compare our situation to being in a war where we are under threat, because truthfully we are. Spiritually speaking, we're under a grave threat. And if we're in wartime, we know that at any instant, the enemy can act and take us off the map. So our sense of um, awareness would be completely different from what we have now. I mean, look at the way we live now. We live now just sort of floating from thing to thing. Oh, today I'm going to go to work. And tonight, maybe I'll go and watch a game at my friend's house, or we'll go do this. You know, it's sort of drifting. But if we, as a country, were in a war, none of us would behave that way. <laughs> We'd be very much aware of how precious each moment is and the potential for threats to be around any corner. Spiritually, we are in that state, but we're not aware of it. If we become aware of it, then we would know we need this very intense, constant vigilance. But the enemy is not outside of us. It's inside of us. The enemy is the ego. It's our desires. It's our bad habits. It's our tendency to slip into a dream state, to be hypnotized, to be on autopilot. It's all of our jealousy and envy and fear and gluttony and greed and all of that stuff that we carry around with us. That's the enemy. Not only that, but if we can die in any given moment, not knowing. So the first step is to behave as though we don't know where the enemy is or where the enemy will strike, but we know we're under threat. It's to have that level of vigilance, watching oneself. With that, we start to gather information. We're basically looking for spies. You need proof. You need evidence. You need to gather a lot of evidence. So that's what self-observation is about. It's about learning how your mind functions, how your heart functions, how your body functions, and looking for the evidence of who is manipulating your behaviors. When that anger comes up and you're observing that anger and you start to observe it, you're gathering information. So that's phase one. Phase two is that you judge the information, but this is done separately. There's an actual meditation practice that we will learn where you sift through that information, but you don't do it with your intellect. You don't do it with your emotion. You don't do it with physical senses. You don't do it by speculating. You do it with the consciousness. And this is a very different process. You have to access a state of meditation where you then review all the data that you accumulated that day. Like watching a movie. But you're observing it objectively. As though it's somebody else. Once that information is observed objectively, you actually start to learn. You learn new things. Your consciousness gathers information, understanding you start to understand. And when you start to understand that anger consciously, you weaken it. It loses its power over you. Until eventually, you can see it for what it is. It cannot manipulate you anymore. In essence, you've liberated yourself from it. That's when the third phase can happen, which is execution. When that anger can be destroyed. So those are the three phases, gathering information about the spies. The second is judging the spy. Third is executing the spy. So we're talking about the first phase, gathering information. And in that phase, you cannot judge because you don't know all the facts. What? You have to check the facts, man. All facts. That's the first two lectures I was emphasizing that constantly. Facts, facts, facts. No guesswork. No theories. No speculation. No beliefs. You're not saying, oh, maybe this and maybe that. No, that's poison. You want to strictly avoid that. You're only gathering facts. I came home. My kid said this. I got mad. I had this kind of thought. I had this kind of emotion. My body felt like this. I got stressed. I got tense. I started acting out. 
those are facts. That's what you take to your meditation. Then later you meditate on those facts. You replay the event. You observe the scene as though you were a police officer come to the house to get all the facts about what happened in there. Once all the facts are gathered, then you take it to the judge. And the judge says, this is what happened and this is what happened. Now that uh, quality is sent to the execution. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,